EP1100, Data Communication and Computer Networks. Some illustrations in this material are collected from Forosan Data Communications and Networking, published by McGraw-Hill. In this section we look at multiple links, but also multiple nodes. We've seen how we can build data link networks and extend them by switching them together by a bridge, and later we look at a node being a router on the network layer. So what's the purpose of having many links and nodes? Why not just one node? Well, if that node fails, there surely is a single point of failure. And there's an issue of scalability if you span many users, many computers, and a large geographic area. The cost of the infrastructure might not be the cheapest also if you build with many links and just one node. So given that you want to build a network I have free choice of how many links and how many nodes you want to use for the network. You end up with the network design problem. The network should cover all locations where the nodes are placed. And you would like to optimize the number and the length of the links and the number of the switches. Optimize here could be minimizing the number of links and number of switches. There could be more advanced optimization criteria than that pertaining to, for instance, uh, reliability, costs, and availability of paths where links could be easily pulled. The network design also requires forecasting of communication demands so that you know that when the network is ready, it fulfills the expectations, and also it might have a margin so that the use can grow in the coming years or in the coming time before the network should be updated but we don't include network design in this course. Instead, we will assume that the network is given and from there on, we will try to find paths through that network or routes through that network that fulfill some criterion of optimality. But let's first return to the problem of the learning bridge. If we have two learning bridges connecting two local area networks, we have a loop problem. Look here if the frame is sent from A to D. Both bridge 1 and bridge 2 will learn that A is located on port 1 and will then forward the frame on port 2. The frame coming from bridge 1 will reach bridge 2 on port 2. So it now says, ah, A is located on port 2. And the same way, the frame coming from bridge 2 will reach bridge 1 and it will also believe that A is now located on port 2. And like this, they will continue to forward the frame back and forth and they will never converge on a decision of where A is actually located. So when we build extended local area networks, we have to ensure that there are not any loops in the topology. But we would like to have two bridges perhaps because of reliability. Hence, we have to have a way of from that physical topology disconnecting certain parts of the bridges so that we can have a network which does not have any loops. For instance, if we disconnected port 1 on bridge 2, then we would not have a loop here. We need a protocol to run among the bridges that detects loops and disable ports on the bridges so that we end up with a graph that has no loops. So we'll introduce an algorithm that runs on the bridges and allow them to dynamically discover a loop-free subset graph of the topology, namely a tree. It allows a path between every pair of land segments where, which are physically possible, meaning that the tree is spanning. So it provides the full connectivity of the physical topology, but it does so without having any loops. It uses the fact that all bridges have unique IDs. These are MAC addresses of 48 bits. Could be a port address on the bridge. And the bridges exchange configuration messages. They call configuration bridge protocol data units, but that's not very important to remember. And there is a cost that can be calculated for each path between two bridges. Typically, we count the number of hops in as the cost. One hop corresponds to passing one bridge. The protocol 
allows selection of one bridge as the root node in the tree. And it elects a designated bridge on each LAN to forward traffic from that LAN towards the root node. The protocol furthermore selects a root path which is the best path with respect to this cost from the bridge towards the root. And importantly it selects the port that can be included in the spanning trees and all the other ports although they are fully functional will be blocked and will not forward any traffic. So let's look at these configuration messages which is the basic of the computation of the spanning tree. They consist of a triplet the root ID, so which is a 48-bit address, the cost, usually counted in hops, and the transmission bridge ID, which is another ID of 48 bits. These messages are sent to multicast ad address, which is referred to as all bridges. So there are only the bridges in the network that participate in the computation of the spanning tree. At this point in time, there is no traffic from the computers connected to the local area networks. So there are rules for selecting which configuration message will be used in a bridge. Consider that we have two messages in the bridge, C1 and C2. Then C1 is better than C2 if the root ID in C1 is strictly smaller than the root ID in C2. If the root IDs are equal, then we look at the cost. And if the cost is lower in C1, then it's a better configuration message than configuration message C2. And if the configuration messages are equal with respect to the root ID and the cost, then we look at the transmission ID and select the message with a smaller transmission ID. With these choices, it becomes a simple numerical comparison of the configuration messages. We simply see the configuration message as a number consisting of root ID as the most significant part, the cost, and then transmission bridge ID as the least significant part. So here are three examples. If we have two messages, 92, 13, 143, and 107, 248, then it's clear that the left one will be selected because it has smaller numerical value than the one to the right. If you look at the second example here, we see that they have the same root ID, but the cost is lower on the message to the left, and therefore it's selected. Here, if you look at this as just decimal numbers, it looks as if the message to the left is greater than the one to the right. But you have to understand that the comparison is done on the binary representation of these values, which means that both the root ID and the transmission bridge ID are 48 bit numbers. So, therefore, the va numerical value of 143 is a string of 48 bits, and also numerical value of 8 is represented by a 48 bit long string. Finally, the last example, where we see that the message to the right agrees with the message to the left on both root ID, cost, but then we use the transmission ID to, comp to select which of the two configuration messages that should be used. From this rule, it's clear that there's always a clear decision which of two configuration messages should be used. So the spanning tree process consists of all bridges sending configuration messages to this multicast address, all bridges. A bridge receives configuration messages from all neighboring bridges, and it uses these configuration messages to see whether it should update its own configuration message that it has sent out before. And if it changes this message, it will send out a new configuration message. This way, the bridges receive configuration messages, they do some computation, and send out new configuration messages. And this goes on until the computation of the tree has converged. The bridge with the smallest ID is selected as a root bridge. And that's a unique choice for all the bridges in the network. They can agree on that. When this message exchange has converged the bridge will mark the port with the least cost path to the root bridge as a root port. Here again, least cost means shortest path in number of hops. On each LAN segment, the algorithm will select a designated bridge. 
This is the bridge with the least cost path to the root bridge. And the bridge will mark all the ports to and from this designated bridge as designated ports. And on those ports, it will send configuration messages. When traffic will start to be sent, it will only be forwarded on marked ports, which are both the designated ports and the root ports. The other ports will be blocked because they have been eliminated in the computation to avoid loops. Here's an example from the book Interconnections by Radia Perlman. We have a bridge with node ID 92. It doesn't know anything about the network it, that it's part of. So when it sends out a configuration message, it announces that I'm the root. 92 is its number. The cost for it to reach itself is, of course, 0. And the transmission ID of the bridge that says this is 92. At some time later, the bridge has received configuration messages from its neighbors. So it has a node on the left, which does not know anything about the network either. So it has also announced that it's a root in the network. Then we have four messages, which all agree on that the root has ID 41. But they differ in cost. The lowest cost to reach the root is 12, announced by two other nodes. So we have to select one of those messages as being the message on the root port. And since the transmission ID is 111 in one case and 315, we select the red message here according to the configuration rules that we've gone through. Given that, we can now send an updated message to uh, our node 81, informing it that the root ID, as known at this point, is 41. The cost to reach it is 13, because it was 12 from 111, and now passing bridge 92, the cost is incremented to 13. And the node that sends this message is 92. 92 also informs node 125, because it has a better path to the route than what 125 knew. It announced the cost of 191, and now it will be able to reach the route with a cost of 13 via node 92. Bridge 81 and bridge 125 will use bridge 92 as their designated bridge. And the ports from 92 towards those will be the designated ports. The port from 92 towards 111 will be the root port, because that is the shortest path from 92 towards the root. And the two other ports towards bridge 90 and bridge 315 will be blocked. So we see here we have a tree where two branches from 81 and 125 come to 92 and forward towards 111. The spanning tree protocol also includes management functions in terms of failure and changes in topology of the extended local area network. It does so by including a message age in the configuration messages. And this age is incremented with units of time. And when a message has reached a maximum age, it will be discarded, because that indicates that the message cannot be trusted. The root node sends configuration messages with an hello time, which is usually two seconds. And the age is zero on those messages. And that triggers the bridges to send configuration messages on their designated ports. So therefore, every two seconds, there will be new messages sent out in the whole tree. And as said, the configuration messages age and are discarded if no new messages arrive. And when a message has expired, then it's an indication that something has happened in the network. The bridge cannot know what has happened. It could be a node has failed, it could be a link that has failed, but it recalculates the spanning tree without the expired message. So we go back to the example we had before. This was the converged tree topology among these nodes. And now the message from uh, 111, which was on the root port, 
has expired. 92 does a new computation and the configuration message that arrives from node 315 will be selected because it has a lower cost than the one coming from node 90 and therefore the root port now goes towards node 315. It should be remarked that even though ports are blocked, the bridges send and receive configuration messages on those ports, but they don't forward any traffic on a blocked port. The failure management is needed because of topological changes in the network. And until the new span entry has been computed, there could be loss of connectivity. So it could be as long as 20 seconds before a node reacts to an expired message. Also, when the computation is going on, there could temporarily be loops where packets multiply in the network. One bridge could compute the new spanning tree faster than another bridge, and during that convergence time for the second bridge, there could be loops. Bridges wait some time before they reconfigure the status of the ports. For instance, taking blocked ports into operation and changing which of the port will be the new root port. The recommended time for this is 30 seconds. And the reason is that there could be intermittent faults. Say that someone trips over a cable and takes the cable and plugs it back into the switch. But when the reconfiguration starts, then the node recalculates the algorithm without expired messages, as I have explained. Another topic that I want to mention, which is good to know about, is virtual LANs. It's a management concept and allows a way to differentiate one big LAN into different parts without the physical reconfiguration. So if you have an extended LAN that spans a big organization, you can partition it into virtual LANs that, for instance, span a department in that big organization. So you have a virtual LAN for the accounting department and another one for the engineering department. Each virtual LAN can have its own resources connected to it, such as printers and servers. And it's possible to move computers within that virtual LAN without reconfiguration. It's also possible to create virtual workgroups by virtual LANs and keep broadcasts isolated. Remember that a learning bridge that does not know of a MAC address will broadcast that frame out on all its outgoing ports and here it will only broadcast it within the virtual LAN and not the big extended LAN. There might also be a reason to keep different protocols from each other. So in summary, there is a looping problem when you have multiple nodes connecting many different local area networks. And the learning bridges in the network, they don't detect loops. So therefore, we have to add a protocol to the bridges so that loops will be avoided. And this is the spanning tree protocol. It's a distributed route computation and results in a routing which is free of loops. The new topology of the network is a tree, meaning that it provides connectivity among all the computers connected to the network, but it doesn't have any loops. And the protocol also includes fault management when links and nodes fail. The spanning tree does not give the shortest physical path between computers in the network. If you want to do shortest path routing, you have to do that at the network layer, which I will cover in the next module. And I introduced the concept of virtual LAN for ease of management of large extended local area networks.